there's a few different sort of topics that I want to to dig into. Um, some of the things that you speak about quite regularly and written about in your book, given that you just mentioned yeast infections, maybe we start there. <laughs> is is yeast infections an area where you feel there is a lot of misinformation? Oh yeah, I mean, and some of this is you know we're just we're still learning new things about the microbiome. So I would say that what I believed about a yeast infection when I graduated from residency in 1995 is completely different than what I know today. Um, and that's fantastic. It's great that I know more. Uh, and, you know, the technology to know what we know now wasn't available then. So it's really cool when new technology comes out. So yeah, I mean, I think that part of the problem is vaginal symptoms are, you know, one of the number one reasons women will seek gynecological care. And there's a lot of disinformation. It's also something that's often dismissed. Oh, it's just an irritation or this, that. And people people don't get the time spent with them that they need to really go through the symptoms. Right. So what is a yeast infection? So a yeast infection is an overgrowth of the yeast that is almost always certainly normally there to begin with. And why that happens, we don't really know. So if, if I stopped 100 women walking down the street and just did a culture from their vagina, 20% of them would have yeast at any given time. And if I followed those women for a whole year, by the end of the year, probably 80 to 90% would have had yeast at any one point, but they have no symptoms. So it's this shift between the yeast that's normally there and in harmony with the whole microbiome to sort of this overgrowth of yeast. And that can happen for a variety of different reasons. And what are the main symptoms that someone would experience? Vaginal itching, vaginal burning would be the big common ones. Pain with intercourse, a feeling of dryness. People mistakenly believe that a white discharge is associated with yeast infection, but it's actually a very unreliable sign. And so, and part of the reason we have this misinformation is just talking about vaginal health is difficult. You know, people are made to feel shameful. The number of women I see who think that it's abnormal to have vaginal discharge is still astounds me, but that's the power of shame. Is a yeast infection sexually transmitted? No. Uh, yeast isn't sexually transmitted, although there is some belief that um, biofilms, which are sort of these complex ways bacteria and yeast can sort of avoid capture, I'm not explaining it well, but that's kind of in the gist, that um, that they can possibly be carried back and forth on a penis. And so, so there may be some factors related to intercourse that can change the environment in a way for some people um, that can increase the risk, but it's not sexually transmitted or in the way that we would think. And how would a diagnosis be made? So we actually know that diagnosing yeast without seeing somebody is very unreliable. So there are about th only 30% of people, 30 to maybe 50% of people who think they have a yeast infection actually will, which is pretty bad, right? Like that's flipping a coin. So, you know, we want to look under the microscope and see yeast. We want to see classic signs on exam, inflammation, edema, uh, a positive culture. There's also um, DNA-based testing, um, molecular diagnostics. So it'd be a variety of different ways. Once somebody knows those symptoms are for them a yeast infection, then probably repeated visits aren't necessarily needed for diagnosis as long as it's infrequent. But if somebody's getting three or more infections a year, they definitely need to be seen. Right. So is that common once you've had a yeast infection once? you're more at risk of having it again in the future? Um, not for probably a single one, but there, if we look at overall, you know, more than half the population has had a single yeast infection, about 5% of people will get recurrent infections. And we just don't understand why that is. So I think you said 30 or 50% of the time, it's not a yeast infection. So what else could it be if not yeast infection? Sure. So a lot of times, because again, of our cultural shame, People use the word vagina to describe everything, to their vulva as well as inside their body, which is the vagina. So a lot of times when people call in and say they have a, a yeast infection, what they mean is they have a vulvar itch. So that's what's really important to ask people where the symptoms are. And so a lot of times it's either atopic dermatitis, so irritation from a product. Uh, people can get eczema on their vulva. They could also be bacterial vaginosis, which is a vaginal, um, another vaginal infection. Uh, trichomonas less likely, but it's a sexually transmitted transmitted infection. Um, and those would be like the most common things that we would see. There's also skin conditions that can produce vulvar irritation and even vaginal irritation. So it's a wide variety of things. Right. So what does treatment look like once it is diagnosed as a yeast infection? 
because this is where I hear yeah. all sorts of stuff. <laughs> and I read a blog of yours talking about <laughs> um, inserting a clove or two into the vagina, yeah, yeah, I think. Um, yeah, which seems like something that you probably don't want to try. Um, where, where's, what is the sort of evidence-based best practice treatment for a yeast infection? Yeah, so the evidence-based best practice treatment is an azole, either a topical, which you know we might know as myconazole or you know terconazole or um, you know any one of the azoles that's available over the counter, clotrimazole, um, and or an oral one, fluconazole. Those are those are kind of the first line therapies, and uh, they work equally well. Um, one's not better than the other. I think people often think that the oral is going to be better. It's not. Um, it's just personal preference. Um, you know, some people dislike the mess of a topical, uh, and other people dislike the idea that they're putting something in their whole body where they only need a treatment in the vagina. So it's great to have choices. And that's the evidence-based treatment. You'll get, a, you know, a 93 to 95% success rate. Wow. Yeah. So where does this idea about garlic come from? <laughs> well, I think it's, again, one of those old-timey things. You know, I think people forget that before germ theory, people just, like, did stuff. You know, they're like, uh, you know, they, you know, they used to do vaginal, I mean, they would put vaginal arsenic, they do cold water douches and plug the vaginas, all kinds of like nasty old timey therapies from before we actually knew things. And, you know, I think garlic's a carryover from that. You'll see it in many, many different sort of old time recipes, if you will, from when medicine and religion were basically kind of the same thing. So have any studies looked at that? Uh, I don't think so. Um, not, you know, allicin, which is the supposedly antifungal substance in garlic is only released by crushing it. I don't know if anybody's ever had a cut on your finger and what it's like to get garlic in that. Um, but that would be what you would expect all through the vagina. And then of course there's the idea that, you know, could you get botulism from that? I don't know. So doesn't sound very pleasant. Doesn't sound very good. And it also doesn't work. I've had to pick cloves out of people's vaginas that have done it and it's you know it's it's people are really victimized by what they they are exposed to online this episode is proudly brought to you by inside tracker track your blood biomarkers understand your biological age and receive personalized lifestyle tips backed by evidence to optimize your health to get started with inside tracker today and get 20 percent off your first purchase head to insidetracker.com forward slash simon that's insidetracker.com forward slash Simon for 20% off. Boric acid? Yeah, so that's another old timey solution that is, uh, you know, been around forever. And it, boric acid is, uh, you should think of boric acid like bleach. It's, it's really a disinfectant. That's what it is. And so it can have a place for people who have azole resistant yeast infections where nothing else has worked. Uh, and so you're, you know, that this is it, this is no other option. Uh, and so that can be compounded to use vaginally for that. Um, but people have to remember it's sort of killing everything in the vagina. So it's, it's a suboptimal thing, but sometimes that's what we have to use. Uh, and we do sometimes use it when people have recurrent bacterial vaginosis as part of a complex regimen to disrupt the biofilm that we think might be there. So it's acting truly as a detergent. It doesn't acidify the vagina all right. What about the effectiveness of diet and carb restriction, in particular sugars? I've seen that put forward as a potential strategy for yeast infections. Yeah, no. So actually that's been studied. So what is, I think a lot of people don't understand is the vagina actually is quite high from a glucose standpoint because that's what feeds the lactobacilli. So it's actually a pretty glucose rich environment. And it Many times during the menstrual cycle, you may have actually more glucose, a higher percentage or a higher concentration in your vagina than you actually have in your plasma. So if you eat something with sugar, it doesn't raise the level of sugar in your vagina. And someone actually studied that. They, they gave a group of women, uh, you know, a, the 100 gram load of, um, you know, glucose or 75 gram, and they tested their, um, their, their, blood, their blood sugar and they measured the vaginal levels. And of course, it didn't change. There so, you go. Yeah. So I think that some of it's a, a misunderstanding of what happens when people have diabetes. So there is a higher incidence of yeast infections for people who have diabetes, but that's a complex thing. Part of it we think is related 
to the impact on the immune system from diabetes. And the other part is almost certainly related to the fact that if your blood sugars are elevated or if you're taking the medicine like Jardiance, which causes you to spill glucose into your urine, that when you're going to the bathroom now, you're you're basically bathing your vulva in a higher sugar solution. Because when we go to the bathroom, we all get a little urine plume on our skin. That's normal. And so that's probably the mechanism, a combination of immune things and glucosuria. Is that where most of the misinformation surrounding yeast infections lies? It's the uh, putting putting forward of natural alternative uh, options instead of the classes of drugs that you re- that you mentioned. Yeah, and I think also just a misunderstanding of what it is. So people think that they should be able to get rid of all the yeast in their body, and you can't. I mean, we it's all part of our microbiome. I think that people are they view you know, when you take a, a medication like say fluconazole and say you get a recurrence of yeast in six months, well, then that medicine didn't really work for you. But it did because we expected it to just treat that acute infection. And I think part of it is the complexity of it. Like we don't really understand why people get recurrent yeast infections. There's something in the local immune system that we just don't understand. And when people don't understand things, when we have this, this, uncertainty that opens the door for predators and it comes off as a lack of confidence right and so when people come to see me i mean i'm incredibly confident when i explain all of this and then when people i say you know i'm not telling you this because i don't know how how yeast infections works i'm telling you this because this is the state of the art of the science and so you know i think it's People, we all like heuristics. We all want things boiled down to something simple. And wouldn't it be great if you could just change your diet? I see people who haven't had a slice of cake in six years. And they're, they still have their yeast infections. And I'm like, go home and have a slice of chocolate cake. Really. Just life is for enjoying yourself. You know, d- you know don't deny a simple pleasure because obviously it didn't work. If that worked, no one would have yeast infections. We Everybody would know the answer. It's It gets back to also this use of conspiracy theory language in alternative medicine, right? They don't want you to know. It's like, well, okay, but diet's a pretty simple answer. If that were really the case, we'd have it solved. I think some people think putting diet forward is not a profitable treatment solution no one can profit off of that and therefore um, we're seeing more doctors recommend medications so i understand in this case you're talking about there was a study it showed it didn't work right and if that study had have showed it did work you would probably recommend it Uh, um, but yeah i think that's the position that that many people take here or what how they feel is that diet's not putting put forward or sleep's not being put forward because it's not profitable well i would push back and i would say diets are hugely profitable to people who sell them (laughs) so the number of diet books that are out there the number of doctors that have their own diet plans and supplements to um you know go with their diet plans i would say actually diets are really very profitable i mean there was a book called the uh the i think it's called the yeast connection which of course promoted this anti candida diet the number of people this is like a cottage industry this anti candida diet so i would say that well i don't know i think it is profitable again i think the idea that um so for example whether i talk to somebody talk to someone about diet or i talk with them about fluconazole i get paid the same completely the same. It makes no difference to me what I talk with somebody about. Uh, And for most doctors, that's actually the case. We don't get money for writing a prescription. That doesn't exist. Now, there are some doctors who are on speaker boards and things like that. And do those kinds of kickbacks influence their prescribing? Yes, absolutely. That's why pharmaceutical companies do that. But the majority of physicians actually aren't getting those kickbacks. And so I think that it's a case of a few kind of contaminating the whole. A few bad apples. Yeah. The class of drugs, Azole, I think you said they mm-hmm. they end in. What's their safety profile like? Oh, they're incredible. Well, they're different ones. So I think that's important to, you know, not all azoles are exactly the same. Uh, so the topicals 
just irritation from using them. Oral fluconazole, incredibly safe. We use it for, you know, in the doses uh, for yeast infections. Is there's no blood testing that's required. We can give it to people once a week for years if we have to when people have recurrent infections that uh, that we can't control in other ways. Now, if you're looking at a drug like itraconazole, which is also an azole, but it's different, which we might use for someone who's got a fluconazole-resistant strain, then we do have to do some liver tests at the beginning to make sure. There's other azoles that we don't use for yeast infections because they have a higher risk of liver injury. So for example, ketoconazole. And so we can't sort of lump them all together, but the one that we use most commonly, fluconazole, is really very safe. Mm-hmm.